I'm Jeffrey Clapp. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I think the most important thing is to get out of theory. A lot of startup founders meet at a coffee shop and they keep meeting at coffee shops and they keep talking about how they're going to change the world and how amazing things are going to be and how wonderful they're going to be. And everything's in the future tense. Go build something. Go do something. It doesn't even really matter what it is, but do something together, right? Build something, make something happen. Across the board of entrepreneurship, traction is so important. I'm looking for people who solved something, they did something. I don't even care if it was great, just that they went through the process together. Pitch skills are overrated. Build something amazing and investors will find you. They want to see what's your distribution model, what's the product, what's the problem you're solving, how are you going to access these people, how much money are you going to make, and do you have the right team to get there? It's not okay just to sit in your office and say, this is what I think people would want. Great startups go and talk to their users. Great startups get out there. Great startups say, hmm, if I want to build a photo sharing app, let's talk to people who take photos. If someone's truly vested in helping you with the company, it doesn't start by saying, well, give me a percentage of the company and then I'll help you. You should meet people in the ecosystem that provide value. And one of the things I really struggle with is I see companies who pivot or change or do whatever they need to do as they refine their business model, but their mentors aren't changing. Your core business advisors should be helping with recruiting your team, with your business model, with your distribution model, and the product market fit. If they're not helping you with one of those four things, if they're not fundamentally the best in one of those things, they're the wrong people to be working with. And it's okay to say, I want to upgrade my mentor. I think one of the problems that people have when they build their teams, they build top down, really bad sign. You probably don't need a CFO or a CMO or a CTO or a COO. Why do you need junior and senior titles in your startup? You don't. What you need is a group of people that are busting their tail to get something done. It doesn't matter what their titles are. They're going to earn their titles. It's about having the roles defined and having a deep respect for each other's contribution. When you're dealing with Apple or IBM or Microsoft, one bad person doesn't have a huge effect on the overall culture. Right? It's one of how many tens of thousands of people. When you have five people sitting in a tiny room, one person is 20%. If that one person isn't pulling their weight, they're taking away from everybody else. You're rowing a boat all the same direction. Right? So focus on the task and solving the problem and let the culture start to form. Really what it comes down to is, is this a great idea by a great team solving a meaningful problem with a real business model? So engage deep. Don't be afraid to change. Solve problems. Don't get caught up in the process and the culture of entrepreneurship. Go be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs do three things. They birth the new in a simple way. That is to say, every type of innovation we have has largely come from people thinking innovatively, and most of them come from firms that were created to bring forth this new technology that the inventor entrepreneur thought up. The second thing they do is even much more important, and that is when new firms are started, they create jobs. This is actually quite apparent, but economists and policymakers and politicians don't get this. You know, if you're running General Electric or General Motors, your stockholders want higher productivity. They want more product coming out for less expense. It's a simple equation. It's the amount of product divided by the number of people who work in the company. And if you're the president of one of those companies, your job is to drive that number on the denominator down. You want fewer people. Well, if you start a brand new company, 
and you're going to make something, you're going to deliver a service or a product, you got to have people. So you don't want to have more employees than necessary. But without employees, you've got nothing. So new firms hire. And in fact, the statistics from the Kauffman Foundation tell us that new firms are the place where all new hiring takes place, the net job creation. And it's not a small number. On average, new firms in the United States create about 3 million jobs a year. In fact, at the margin, that is where all the jobs are that are created in the economy that are, that are new, it's new firms that do it. Put differently, the United States, unlike a lot of countries, has a growing population, has a growing labor force. We need 3 million brand new jobs every year. That's if everybody else kept their job. With the entry of young people, with the coming of immigrants, with people returning to the labor market, we need 3 million new jobs every year. And those jobs are the vast preponderance. Almost all of them come in firms that are less than five years old. Now, the third thing that entrepreneurs do with their new companies is they create all the new net wealth in the society. So if we didn't have new companies, the society would gradually grow in relative terms poorer. Now we think about entrepreneurs as actually sometimes becoming very rich. We have in mind Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Sergey Brin. These guys get very, very wealthy. But in fact, the real wealth goes into the society. It's estimated that the people who start these firms take a fraction in some cases, less than a percent of all the new net wealth that their companies generate for the society. Think about what Bill Gates did with Microsoft. Now, he made a fortune for himself, tens of billions of dollars. But he's made every one of us richer in economic terms. We are all much better off. So these are all the things that entrepreneurs do. They keep pushing the innovative, they push the new, they make jobs for people, and they make wealth for the society. America and the world will, as long as human beings walk this planet, need innovators, need inventors, need entrepreneurs. Often, the future of innovation doesn't begin with entrepreneurs. It begins with people who have no idea that there's ever going to be any money in this space. They're just doing it because they love it and because they're excited about it. When we launched Make Magazine and Make It Fair, what we were noticing was that there were a lot of people who were playing with some new technologies that nobody was really taking quite seriously enough. In the beginning, it was just people with sort of crazy fun projects. I remember back in the first issue of Make Magazine, I think one of the projects was a guy who'd built a programmable cat feeder out of an old VCR. It was that kind of hobbyist stuff. But what we've seen again and again over the years is hobbyists who turn into hotbeds of a new industry. Revolutions don't always belong to the people who make the most success out of them. We need to remember that business is about creating value, not just extracting value. Sometimes the heroes might be people who never make a dime from it. Where our economy and our culture has gone off the rails is with businesses that think they're only about making money. You know, as opposed to thinking of businesses as platforms for people to get things done, and people thinking of themselves as makers of their own lives, and you do that not by trying to figure out necessarily where the money is, it's by finding out where the need is, or in a lot of cases, surprisingly, it's finding out where the joy is. Because things that are fun are fun for a reason. And it's amazing how many people have ended up making businesses out of things that were their hobbies. I think that self-motivated spirit is what drives entrepreneurs. We need to have it drive everyone. You know, because if you do something useful, if you do something for love, some good percentage of those things will actually turn into a business. That's really the heart of entrepreneurship, wanting to make something happen.
Most young companies need money, which may or may not come as a big surprise, but they do. The number one source they get money from is from their own savings. Whether it's a few hundred dollars or even thousands of dollars, that's what we tend to tap first. And a lot of companies don't get money from any other place. They get money from their own savings, and then after that, they're lucky enough to be cash flow positive. They're profitable. So we talk a lot as if all companies require all sorts of external capital, and the reality is that more than half of young companies get all their funding from a combination of founder savings and then cash flow from the business, and we're out of here. Next up on the list is another one that catches, I think, people by surprise, and that's credit cards. Almost every young company you can think of, to one degree or another, was funded on credit cards. And it is the single largest source of capital for young companies after founder savings. And then the next place where they tend to get money is from friends and family. After I've tapped out my credit card and I've used up all my savings, I turn to people I know and say, hey, will you help me? And that's the third biggest source of capital. And then the next place is banks. And the banks are a totally weird situation because with banks, they get a lot of attention, but they actually fund very, very few young companies. But it's not their fault. You have to think about the way bank lending works and how shareholders want banks to lend. They want them to lend money against secured assets. And young companies don't have any security. They have nothing to secure it against. And the joke in the industry is, is you can get all the bank funding you want as a startup as long as you don't need it. And then the last piece is venture capitalists. They get the lion's share of the attention, which in some ways is warranted. You know, your Googles and Apples and FedExes and many others all have venture capital money inside of them. But the reality is, is and this is from Kaufman research, less than 20% of the fastest growing companies in the United States took any venture money. And that's not because the VCs wouldn't give it to them. It's because they didn't want it or didn't need it, because they had all those other sources. I don't need money, and I certainly don't need money on these terms. Because, you know, venture capitalists, unlike banks, they don't lend against secured assets. They give you money in exchange for shares. So they take some of your company away. So my answer is, is if you don't need it, definitely don't get it. There's no question the venture industry has become stayed. The irony is it's intended to fund disruption, and yet it's an industry that had become complacent. And interestingly, over the last five or six years, we've seen the emergence of other mechanisms for funding, like AngelList, like these kinds of peer-to-peer -peer funding sources. As people increasingly provide capital in smaller amounts, but more people doing it, directly. Having said all of that though, venture capitalists are hugely important for those young companies that don't have access to bank money, but are growth companies. They have the prospect of being a $5 million or a $10 million company in a couple of years, and they need that growth capital to get there quickly. So it's a race. And the way you play the race is by getting money from people like venture capitalists who give you the money so you can, you can compete with other people who are racing as fast as you are. If you can run a company off cash flow and some combination of credit card, your own savings and friends and family, you know, Bob's your uncle, run, run, you know, keep all the equity because, you know, there's no better thing than being in full control of your own destiny. The next great entrepreneur is out there. A person with a passion to turn an idea into a business, create jobs, grow the economy, and change the way we live, work, and play. The next great entrepreneur is out there. Will it be you? An entrepreneur with an idea can change the world. Get started now at willitbeyou.com.